Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacroix. Hey, Francine. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix in London. Here's what's coming up on today's program. No holiday cheer. Global stock markets are mixed ahead of U.S. inflation data, while tech faces its worst December since the dot-com bubble burst. Bankman freed bail. Well, the FTX co-founder is released on a $250 million bond, ensuring he's unlikely to wait trial behind bars. Plus, China's soaring COVID infections are keeping people home and causing a slump in travel and economic activity. So first thing is first, so let's check in on the markets. Now, we started the day a little bit higher than we went lower, and today actually... Uh, we seem to be uh, um, holding on to some gains. All of this excitement over the holiday period is also making me lose my voice. But that has been regained, I assure you. Now, a couple of things we're watching out for is, of course, uh, data over in the U.S. Again, global stock markets today are a little bit mixed ahead of that U.S. inflation data. U.S. futures actually fluctuating a little bit. Uh, the moves, of course, come through after we saw a U.S. session yesterday when a slump in U.S. technology stocks, but also more economic data validating the case for the Federal Reserve to keep hiking interest rates set a pretty downbeat tone. For the moment, uh, I would suggest we're actually trading sideways. Now, the number of Americans filing new claims for unemployment benefits increased less than expected last week, pointing to a still tight labor market while economic growth in the third quarter was firmer than previously estimated. We're now joined by Nick Scully and his partner at Foresight Group. So, Nick, great to have you on the program. Thank you so much for coming in. So, first of all, you're in the private equity space, right? So we talk markets, but what are you expecting from private markets in 2023? We haven't really seen the downbeat message that we heard in equities, but I wonder whether that's still to come. Yeah, I think private markets are actually operating slightly separately from public markets at, this, at the moment. I think there's obviously a lot of um, expectation around what the Fed's going to do around interest rates and how that's going to land in the economy um, in, in America, but also, of course, around the world. Um, central banks are having to react to what's happening with inflation. Uh, clearly, we see uh, inflation as the most important thing in global markets at the moment, both in terms of pace, but also its underlying drivers. Yeah. So I think private markets are going to respond to that um, yeah. in the course of 2023 um, as, as we get some of that data coming through. So, Nick, we'll talk about inflation in a second, but do you worry about a liquidity crunch or something happening, which, you know, we've seen maybe in 2022 in certain parts of the market? Could it impact and infect private markets? Well, what we've seen in 2022, actually, I think has been a good functioning of yeah. the markets. We haven't seen what we saw in 2020, uh, where we saw really some sort of market failure. Um, I think in 2022, liquidity has been good in the companies that we've been buying in public markets um, with our open-ended funds. We've seen that they've been trading efficiently, so we're not concerned about that at the moment. Mm -hmm. So talk to me a little bit about inflation. If you look at inflation 2022, I mean, this was the big surprise. It, it took, frankly, almost everyone off guard, unless you're like a genius of, of um, I guess, economic analysis. Could it come down as quickly as it came up? Well, I think that's the key question, isn't it? So everyone's really too hung up on peak inflation. So where is inflation going to peak yeah. and are we coming down? I think what the real question is now for central banks is, are we going to get stuck on a ledge on the way down? So yeah. as we head down to policy target rates, um, are we going to get stuck halfway and what are going to be the drives of that? Because very quickly the Fed and other central banks could be out of options if that does happen. Yeah, do you think that happens? I, mean, what's I, think, the I, think, I think it may be difficult okay. for, um, for inflation to get back to policy rates uh, without a very hard landing. So our, okay. our base case at the moment is, is not a soft landing. There are yeah. growth outcomes where that's possible. Uh, but for the moment, we think defensiveness is prudent, right. um, both within asset class allocations, but also within your individual asset classes. So within equities, yeah. for example, we think that being defensive in your allocations and actually we don't think the growth versus value debate is a very helpful one at the moment. We think it's all about quality of earnings. Yeah. How much will these companies be able to continue to continue to grow their earnings? Will they get paid by their counterparties? No. And actually, what is the runway for them in 2023? So how difficult is it at the moment to kind of wade through the noise to see, you know, earnings growth potential? Also given, I mean, we, we tend to forget, but there's still this overhang of COVID and lockdowns. So it's unclear when you pull that apart what we're left with. And I think the overhang of COVID lockdown is compounded by this um, absolute addiction to free money that we've had over the last 10 years. So those two externalities and dis distortions are really going to be prevalent in the market in 2023. Um, you know, I, I don't think that um, inflation is going to come down beyond sort of four or five percent no. in the next six months. And that could be problematic. 
Yeah, but so if you break it down, and again, I know you say, look, you, you like the companies and equities that, you know, where they can pay dividend growth mm. so pass on that inflation. I mean, apart from energy, what is there? Well, where we're looking is at real asset infrastructure. So we're looking at companies that provide critical services to society, whether that's energy, whether it's education, transport. Mm -hmm. It's the kind of companies which are which enjoy long dated cash flows, government backing. Um, they are the ones that have inflation linkage mechanically embedded within their multi decade cash flows. Yeah. Um, those are the ones that I think will continue to be resilient in a yeah. very in a very difficult environment in 2023. Nick, I mean, there, there's a school of thought or certainly about, I would say, 20 percent of economists we speak to that say we could be surprised on the upside in terms of data. So in terms of inflation, maybe not as aggressive as, as we thought it, it could be. Does that change everything from where you want to be in the markets? Well, what we've seen is we've seen, you know, services, data, X, shelter coming down, but also shelter is coming down now as well. Um, so I think we are going to see inflation coming down. Um, I don't think it's going to plummet down from here. I think there are many factors that are still driving inflation, not least the energy crisis in Europe. Yeah. Is that, oh, clearly, that's a supply side shock that central yeah. bank policy can't impact. Uh, but we don't, I don't think that we're going to be back at policy target rate anytime yeah. soon, and definitely not without something big breaking. So how do you play the energy space? Is it through renewables because it gets accelerated or because we're seeing still so much usage of oil? That's the only place where we can really make money. Well, the, the way that we're looking at energy at the moment is we're looking at companies that build, uh, operate, maintain assets that are going to survive and are going to be um, going to thrive in a decarbonizing and a decarbonized world. So we're looking at companies that benefit from the things like the IRA in the US, um, where they're getting policy support and they're getting um, subsidies from governments to actually continue to operate and to deliver on their promises. So, um, Nick, what do you do with China right now? It's un frankly, it's unclear. And, and always we thought of, of, you know, we think about the people that are sick and uh, that, that are, are also, frankly, dying at the moment. In three, six months, how do we work ourselves through this? Very difficult. And clearly China is a, a big unknown. And, you know, for investors, that's a problem. Um, how do you deal with that uncertainty? Um, we think that mid-2023, there may be some sort of COVID unlocking in China. Um, clearly, that would be positive for global markets if that happens in terms of commodity imports and then in terms of emerging markets that rely on those commodity exports. Um, so we think that you know, China is clearly very important in the landscape for 2023. Um, we don't exactly know how, um, how, how the regime there is likely to unlock. But from what we're seeing and from what we're hearing, uh, it looks like mid-2023 might be possible there. OK. I, does that have an impact? I mean, I imagine this has an impact, of course, on your dollar call and therefore on emerging market exposure. Yeah, of course. So, I mean, the way that we think about the dollar is really everything to do with, you know, it's to do with the Fed's act yeah. reaction to inflation. So that's our primary, our primary input there. Yeah. Um, we do see a, a strong dollar persisting throughout 2023 okay. as the Fed is, um, is forced to remain on the trajectory that they've indicated that they'll stay on. And it's amazing how, how the market, um, you know, refuses to listen to that, actually. How, how do you do it? It's true. I mean, the market, why is the market refusing? Because they're too optimistic? Or well, because I think they I, just see peak inflation and think they'll temper? I think, I think the market is, is expecting a pretty serious pivot once we start to see some of the damage done okay. to the labor market. Clearly, that's a lagging indicator, yeah. so it might take three, six, right. nine months to get there. Yeah. Uh, but once we start to see some of, the, um, some of the breaks that Jerome Powell is hoping to enforce on the market, um, I think they're, they're backing a, a shift in policy. So do you buy any bonds? No, we don't buy bonds. It's just not, it's just not just worth not, it, not, right? Not, not, well, it's, it's not in our remit at the moment. Um, so we're equity investors, and everything we buy is listed in public markets in our funds. Okay. Um, but clearly, you know, the attractiveness of bonds compared to where they were months and years ago yeah. um, is post potentially pro problematic for equity investors as well, as allocators who can buy bonds and who want to buy bonds for the yeah. yield swing towards that asset class and away from equities, reducing overall demand. All right, Nick, thank you so much for coming on. Nick Scully and their partner at Foresight Group. Now, coming up, FTX founder Sam Bankman-Fried makes his first appearance at a U.S. court to face fraud charges over the collapse of FTX. The latest on that, just ahead. This is Bloomberg.
Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition on Fronting Lacqua here in London. Now, we are getting some moves at Tesla, actually pre-market, rising some 2% as Elon Musk has vowed to pause selling shares, I think, for 18 months. It might be two years, but of course, we keep on following that story very, very closely. Pre-market, 1.8% higher for Tesla. Now, Sam Bankman-Fried was released on a $250 million bail package after making his first U.S. court appearance to face fraud charges over the collapse of FTX, the cryptocurrency exchange he co-founded. Let's get straight to the latest on this from Bloomberg's crypto senior editor, Anna Herrera. Anna, first of all, I mean, the first, I read the story, I came in this morning, and I thought, wow, that's a lot of money. Where is he getting the money from? So he last said he only had $100,000 in his bank account. So we, we can say that it's not going to be $250 million. There's normally a mismatch between the bail uh, package and how much you need to put in, how many assets you need to put in to secure it. So I think it's going to be around 10%. Um, it's also secured around um, on his equity in his parents' home, which is where he will be staying um, during this period. So it, it's not, it's eye catching, but it's not as big. It don't have, need to put up as quite as much money. It's normally this high because it's a disincentive for you to try to sort of run away. Um, and it's, it's, you know, interesting again, the, 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 the lawyer was saying he's not, you know, um, at, at, they don't consider him to be a flight risk and the judge believed that to be the case because he's well known now. So it would be harder for him to sort of make appear elsewhere without being known. So, so what information do we know is still coming? Like, what's the timeline of, out of all of this, Anna? He's going to appear in court again on January 3rd. He's not made a plea yet. So, um, you know, there are his, his lieutenants we discovered yesterday have, have pled guilty and are collaborating with authorities. This is Carolyn Ellison, who is the CEO of Alameda Research, his sister, the sister trading firm of um, FTX, which was at the heart of, of sort of what, what was going on. And then the CTO of FTX, Gary Wang, who's also a co-founder in Alameda. Um, they also, he also pled guilty. So from that, we learned a bit more about what was going on behind the scenes, which was essentially, um, there, there was much that happened, but a fundamental so part was that Alameda sort of went into, got into some financial trouble when, when Terra collapsed in May. It couldn't meet some of its obligations with lenders, and so they started taking more, um, borrowing more from FTX, uh, so from FTX customers, essentially, from the deposits there to cover those those losses. And um, so, you know, but that, the, the crux of the case is that really um, a lot of the funds that were supposed to be at FTX for, uh, because they were their customer funds were actually misappropriated and used by um, Sam Bankman Freed allegedly uh, for his own personal use and then also to, for, for the sister trading house Alameda Research to trade against. Anna, thank you so much. Bloomberg's crypto senior editor there, Anna Herrera. Now, Guggenheim Partners, chief investment officer Scott Minard, has died. In a statement, the company says a 63 year old died after a heart attack during his regular workout. Here's a look back at his life and legacy. Scott Minard climbed the corporate finance ladder to become a founding and managing partner at Guggenheim Partners. Minard was regarded as one of the most respected voices on the fixed income market over the last decade and a much sought after guest by financial media, including Bloomberg Television, for his view on markets. Minard's first job was at Price Waterhouse, which gave him the opportunity to analyze hundreds of financial statements, something that benefited him later as CIO for Guggenheim. While still in his early 30s, Minard became the global head of fixed income at Credit Suisse, working for legendary investor Bob Diamond. Despite his incredible early success, at the age of 37, Minard decided to move to LA with plans to retire. But in 2000, Minard met members of the Guggenheim family and became one of the founders of Guggenheim Partners. In a statement, Guggenheim Partner CEO Mark Walter said, Scott was a key innovator and thought leader who was instrumental in building Guggenheim Investments into the global business it is today. It probably affected the way I looked at all investments going forward, which was not to just listen to the conventional wisdom of what everybody else was saying, but to, to take what they were saying and, you know, actually, you know, really in reality challenge it.
economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, with a recent breakthrough, U.S. scientists were the first to generate a nuclear fusion reaction that created more energy than it consumed. Now, billionaires such as Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates are already investing in technology. We look at whether it's the answer to the world's clean energy needs and when it might be commercially available. Our Guy Johnson reports. After more than 50 years of failure, scientists have taken a major step closer to achieving near limitless clean energy. On December the 5th, researchers in California succeeded for the first time in generating more energy from a fusion reaction than it consumed. This fusion breakthrough will go down in the history books. This shows that it can be done, which is, was, has been a question. Can you get there? Commercial viability is probably still decades away, but this new technology has huge potential. According to the Fusion Industry Association, each pound of fusion fuel could produce as much energy as 10 million pounds of coal. But what is fusion? Nuclear plants today use fission, where an atom is split to produce energy. Fusion does the opposite. Two atomic nuclei are combined to create a heavier atomic particle, with the reaction giving off energy. It produces no nuclear waste or dangerous radiation. A disaster like Chernobyl isn't possible. Billionaires like Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates and Peter Thiel are already investing. And startups have received almost $5 billion in funding, with Bloomberg New Energy Finance predicting $1 billion this year alone. But not everybody is a believer. Elon Musk, a co-founder of renewable company SolarCity, has said that solar and wind costs are falling so fast that fusion energy will be a dinosaur by the time it's viable. But for now, the breakthrough has sent a major jolt of excitement through the scientific community, energy that surely won't go to waste. Bloomberg's Guy Johnson there on the future of nuclear fusion. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News. Here's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. The House committee investigating the January the 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol has delivered a scathing report blaming, quote, one man, former President Donald Trump, for inciting violence in an attempt to hold on to power. The 800-page report details Trump's behind-the-scenes fury and his efforts to pressure state officials and the Justice Department to overturn the president presidential election. Now, Bloomberg has learned that China plans to cut quarantine requirements for overseas travelers from next month. Under the new rules, arrivals from abroad will only be subject to three days of monitoring. China currently requires travelers to quarantine at a hotel or other facilities for at least five days after their arrival. And a once-in-a-decade winter storm is battering much of the U.S. with snow and also freezing temperatures. More than three and a half thousand flights have been cancelled so far with those through Chicago and Denver the worst affected the American Automobile Association says more than 112 million people plan to travel at least 50 miles at some point and that's over the holiday period inflation in Japan has further accelerated to the fastest pace and that's since 1981 consumer prices excluding fresh food climbed 3.7 percent in November from a year ago matching the estimate the data may fuel speculation that the BOJ will surprise markets again with more policy tightening earlier in the new year. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans. This is Bloomberg Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. That's your Bloomberg First Word News. Now, some of the movers that we need to watch out for, again, it is quite the in volumes, but I love the story. First of all, Bavarian Nordic, really a must watch today, entering an agreement with the U.S. Department of Defense for vaccine development. Uh, the stock is gaining some 5.9%. We should probably talk about Bavarian Nordic more than we do in general. Philips saying that tests on recalled products are showing the limit of the health risk, so that's also getting a boost. Philips gaining some 2.7%, and then Sodexo.
so down some 4.1 percent. This is a huge catering company that also feeds our troops abroad. Now let's also take a look at some of the key things that, that we're watching out for today. We've already had an update on the Spanish economy with GDP numbers coming in as expected. 1.30 p.m. we get a fresh batch of U.S. data including consumer income, home sales and durable goods. Later at 3 p.m. UK time there's more data out of the U.S. with the latest release of the University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Index and then of course it's another day of strikes across Britain this time from border force officers. About 1,000 of them are walking off the job today, creating potential travel chaos at airports around the country. Now, coming up, fancy setting up a new business in the new year? Well, we speak to the co-founder of organic chocolate brands, Green and Blacks, on starting out in a downturn and the headwinds facing businesses in the current environment. That interview is up next, and this is Bloomberg. No holiday cheer. Global stock markets are mixed ahead of U.S. inflation data. Tech faces its worst December since the dot-com bubble burst. Bankman Fried Bale, the FTX co-founder, is released on a $250 million bond with the stipulation to live with his parents as he awaits trial. Plus, China's soaring COVID infections are keeping people home and causing a slump in travel and economic activity. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francie Lacqua here in London. Now, despite the current economic climate, nearly one in three people in the UK have either started their own business or considered doing so in the last year. That's according to new research by accounting professional body AAT. It's something that the Green and Blacks co-founder is no stranger to, having set up the organic chocolate company during the early 90s economic downturn. Well, I'm very pleased to welcome Joe Fairley, co-founder of Green and Blacks. Joe, first of all, really congratulations on building this brand into one of the most recognizable chocolate names out there. What kind of advice would you give to entrepreneurs that want to do something, but actually the economic climate is very tough for them? I think that actually a tough economic climate is a really uh, great opportunity for startups because a lot of the big businesses are very nervous. They've got their finger on the pause button, waiting to see which way the wind blows. And actually when you're a startup, <clears throat> you can just literally you know you've got your goal you you keep powering forward and and you haven't got anything to compare the current trend to so um i see a lot of dynamism during recession times while the big guys are kind of twiddling their thumbs and going oh let's see how this pans out so um joe when you look at you know everything that's going on at the moment is green and black actually recession proof is chocolate in general recession proof or do you have the same kind of inflationary pressures as other markets do i think the great thing about chocolate is that it is a fairly low uh price treat and actually at at times of recession, we want to have those treats probably more than ever. A small treat as opposed to, you know, a big piece of clothing or something. So I think that chocolate is probably recession proof. But I do see that there is a strong trend towards the kind of chocolate that we pioneered and that we still make today, which is ethical, sustainable. You know, during the pandemic, people had a lot of time to think about what where they wanted to spend their money. And I think that that is only going to continue because we are going to be spending less. We are going to be thinking more about what we spend it on. And I think that notwithstanding a cost of living crisis, we still want to make sure that our money is, is spent um, in a good way, you know, with heart. Yeah. Uh, Joe, does that change in a downturn? I mean, I'm not saying it changes, but actually, you know, your high premium um, top end chocolate brand, will people still buy a chocolate brand that's, you know, fairer and better for society, but more expensive if the recession hits? We're just over two quid. I don't think that's expensive. <laughs> I, there's a lot of chocolate out there for eight or twelve pounds now that's actually the same size and the same, um, the same. Uh, cocoa content as ours but doesn't have the sustainable credentials and and it's just you know much much more expensive so i think we're in kind of if you'll pardon the pun a sweet spot but you know i really do encourage um would-be business owners not to buy into the doom and gloom that is out there right now you know as you said aat's study showed that one in three 
people want to start their own business. And there's actually, um, they, they backed a brilliant website called informi.co.uk that actually has a, an ebook on there that people can download for free about how to start your business in 20 days. Now, you know, we're going to have a few days off for Christmas, but if you were to restart on the 27th of December, you know, by the middle of January, you could you could probably have something that was pretty much yeah. up, you know, ready to get running. And that, I find that so exciting. Yeah. No, it is an amazing, and it's an amazing brand. I like to say, you know, you say it's two quid, but actually, I mean, I buy larger packs, so I've never paid two quid. That's like, if you don't like chocolate, Joe, this is maybe, you know, the problem, with the, my problem anyway. Um, when you see some of the inflationary pressures, what do you worry about the most in 2023? Is it the price of cocoa? Is it transport? Is it packaging? I think that um, obviously transport has, has gone up massively. You know, the, the price of containers, et cetera, is, is off the scale compared to where it was a few years ago. And, you know, for smaller brands, that probably means um, prioritising certain markets over others because it can be more expensive to ship less stuff. Um, but, uh, and, and yes, I mean, there's inflation. But, you know, we have been here before. And what I would say to all business owners is keep the faith. You know, just take a lot of deep breaths, give yourself plenty of TLC, because I think it's very important to make sure that as a business owner and, and or a manager, you have the resilience, the personal resilience to kind of weather the storm that we're currently experiencing. It's so important when you've got a team that depends on you, when you, you know, never mind your family, etc. cetera. Um, so, you know, I, I will be keeping my head down while powering forward and I think the great thing about having a business that's been around for a few decades is is you know what goes around comes around and and there will be an end to this but as I say you know for those would-be startups it I think it's a time of great opportunity yeah. But it's hard. I mean, sometimes it's lonely at the top, especially if you have everything on your shoulders. So how do you build a team? Like, if you need advice, if you're going through a tough time as an entrepreneur, who do you speak to? And, you know, what was your relationship like with the banks at the start? Uh, well, the, the first 20,000 for Green and Blacks came from me selling my flat um, to move wow. in with my husband, my business partner. And literally, I had £34 left in the bank after I after I bought two tonnes of the first consignment of green and blacks. Um, so, so, but what I would say is that it's incredibly important to have your finger on the pulse of where your business is financially. You need a great accountant. And what I see often in business, you know, I was lucky. My husband had been in business before. I tapped into a, an existing distribution network that he had with his brand, Whole Earth. But it's very hard for, if it's one entrepreneur starting up on their own, it's very hard for you to be good at, at both the creative side and the financial side of the business. And that's where a trusted accountant comes in, you know, a professional who can literally let you know at any moment of the day or night what your cash flow is, what your projections are, how much money you've got in the bank. I mean, I know you can look on your phone, but, you know, how much no. does that, how much is that really? Um, so, and also any bank that you are dealing with is going to want to know that you have that information right there. Yeah. So, Joe, I mean, one of the other things I hear quite a lot from entrepreneurs or actually, you know, venture capitalists wanting to invest is that there's a concern in Europe and in the UK that very good companies then don't become big quickly enough. And so there's, you know, the, the first mover advantage, if you have a brilliant idea, is squandered compared to some of the US. Do we need to be more like US companies? Like what's, is there a UK advantage? I mean, I, I I truly believe in the kind of first mover advantage for sure. I think that um, I'm, I've I've founded five different businesses now, and they've all been the first of their kind. And I think that you know that I have no interest in something that is a me too um, business. But I do think that um, if you've got a good idea, uh, you know, it, it's going to it's going to take a great deal of work to get it to a point where a venture capitalist is is ready to invest. I mean, it took us nine years. We sound like an overnight success, but um, venture capital came in after nine years. It would probably be quicker now um, because they are more interested in getting in earlier. Um, but, you know, that's where making sure that financially, you're, you know, you, you have everything in place if you want that investment to grow um, is incredibly important.
for sure. But, you know, any would-be entrepreneur who wants to build a global brand, it, it doesn't happen by magic. You have to roll up your sleeves. You probably have to make some sacrifices. And you do have to find a way of striking a personal balance whereby, you know, you're not running on empty while you're trying to build this. And, and Joe, again, what, you know, if there's a, a young entrepreneur or someone that's been thinking for a long time, open a business, what's the perfect mix? Do you start locally here in the UK and see what happens or do you have to start trying to export quite quickly to, to be sure that you have that brand recognition? I think you, you have to decide and you have to be strategic. I think the, the biggest mistake we made at the beginning was actually uh, exporting to too many small markets too quickly because each one of them proved to be as much work as, you know, selling two containers of chocolate to America. Um, and, you know, that's as much that's as much work as sending a quarter of a pallet to Estonia. So um, and I believe it, 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 it one of the best starting points for any business is to put yourself in your customer's shoes. And all of my businesses have been founded on maybe slightly arrogant principle that if I need something and it's not out there, the chances are that lots of other people feel the same way too. That way you can tap into your instincts, you can tap into your insights, you don't need a focus group. You know, if you can't find something, there's probably a business opportunity there. I love that. Joe, thank you so much. Joe Fairley there, co-founder of Green and Blacks, joining us this morning. Now coming up, how has this year fared for UK stocks? We discuss the winners and losers as coming up next. And this is Bloomberg. Finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition and Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, UK stocks have had a wild ride this year, but some have fared better than others. To tell us who sunk and who swam, we're joined by our stocks reporter, Joe Easton. So, Joe, clearly been a tough year for UK stock markets broadly. Which are some of the individual worst performers that stand out to you? That's right. So a lot of these companies are really exposed to the high interest rates. So they've got big debt loads and they've struggled to keep up those financing measures throughout this year. So some of the stocks we've got on the screen here, we're looking at Weatherspoons is a good example. Not only do they have quite a big debt load, but they're also facing this squeeze on both demand and also margins. The cost of keeping beer cold, cooking, that's all coming up given the energy price increase. They've been hit quite severely. Moonpig, Look, birthday cards are pretty recession-proof, but the gifting business is not so recession-proof. People do tend to trade down when you go into recession, buy cheaper gifts. They've also been hit by a strike as well. That might explain why I've had so few Christmas cards this year. Maybe not, though. And also Synergin down the bottom. This was one of the best performers in 2020. It rose around 2,500% on a COVID-19 drug. However, in March, they announced that actually this drug doesn't work and the stock sank and is now down around 93%. So clearly some individual names to keep an eye on, but also the ones that are exposed to the high interest rates are really the ones that have been hurt the most. I'm terrible, Joe. I printed cards, Christmas cards, and haven't sent them yet. How about the most impressive winners of the year? That sounds quite organised to me, I think, Fran. But I think some of the best winners this year, yeah, they're quite surprising, really. We had... Balfour Beatty on the screen here. Now, most of the UK construction companies are really down a lot because they're exposed to the property market, the housing property market, which is really tanked. Balfour Beatty, though, they're building the High Speed 2 project, which will link London to Manchester. Not, might not be ready until 2033, so something to look forward to. But they're also expanding the Hong Kong airport as well. So just an idea how they're diversifying away from the main UK house buildings. Me Group, we spoke about earlier, a bit of a strange one. They run photo booths all around train stations and airports. So when you need a new passport, you go down there and try to look nice for a photo. There's been a big boom in passport demand over the past year. Around 10 million Britons have renewed their passports after the COVID restrictions were removed. So Photo Me, now known as Me Group, up around 80%, a pretty good return for those investors. Um, Joe, so which are the stocks that you think could be attractive in 2023? Yeah, so I do think we could see a bit of a rebound in some of the domestic sectors, so the home builders, the banks, and also the retailers. But there's some really good specific names to look out for. So I think WH Smith, 
very well-known company that was absolutely flying before the pandemic but then was hit by the travel restrictions and that hit a lot of their sales around the airports and train stations still well below pre-pandemic levels and some investors are getting more excited about that one now that could come up gym group i know we'll all be thinking about the gym in january after we veg out over christmas that's at the lower end of the pricing point so people are looking to cut back on their costs but if you're at the lower end of the market like gym group they might be able to maintain their membership numbers and then finally restaurant group and um, they own wagamama and also some of the other chains like frankie and benny's they've been hit hard by the recession fears people cutting back on their spending going out but as i mentioned to you earlier i do love a katsu curry so that to me is one of my favorite stocks out there at the moment <laughs> there you go to easton um single-handedly supporting wagamama thank you so much with the very latest in stocks to watch for next year now tech for valuations have taken a beating this year as expensive growth stocks lose favor with investors this has also hit london-based female-focused health tech company lv which has suffered a big drop in growth this year bloomberg's Tom McKenzie spoke with the chief executive officer Tanya Bowler about the challenges that the business has been facing. Definitely slightly reduced expectations on growth. So having gone from, to be honest, around circa 100% year-on-year growth, this year we're looking at about 25%. How well capitalised are you? How challenging is the funding environment? I will, you know, I'll be honest, it has definitely been difficult this year. You know, I think overnight investors have really moved away from anything with a discretionary spend. But for us at LV, one of our key channels also is health insurance, particularly in the US. So that's very repeatable uh, and, and predictable income. So we've managed to weather that storm. Luckily, we have a group of investors who are there to support us for the long term. OK. And you mentioned the supply chain challenges. Are we at a point now where those have been addressed? Are we back to kind of pre-pandemic levels in terms of supply chain efficiency or are there still areas that are holding back the business? Yeah, there's still, I wouldn't say there's, there's full efficiency across the supply chains in general within consumer electronics. But we have at least seen a real switch from there obviously being a real um, supply issue within Asia, particularly on components and manufacturer. Asia has now ramped up to meet that demand, but we're still seeing a lot of inefficiencies. I want to focus a little bit on the UK before we let you go. The regulatory environment here, you're a successful London-based European tech company with your roots in the UK. What more can this government be doing to support business, businesses like yours? I think it needs the support at every different level. You know, we have a really vibrant ecosystem here in the UK. We have a lot of experience in terms of both uh, now on the investor side and on the other side of the table in terms of entrepreneurs. But for entrepreneurs themselves, we need more entrepreneurs to choose London as that place to set up their businesses. So, for example, entrepreneurs tax relief, uh, that has been cut. I would suggest that needs to be there as an incentive so that, so that entrepreneurs are choosing London over Paris or Berlin. After that, obviously, we need top talent. And for that, we need to be looking again at, you know, the immigration and allowing the, the tech that we know we need the tech talent to come into this country and thirdly i would say in terms of trade we need you know we're a british company we're exporting we need the uk government to be looking increasingly at those export barriers that we're all facing now as british businesses so that's a nod to brexit the brexit effects and your that is a negative that is a drag on on your business absolutely yeah brexit has impacted all uk businesses who export into europe it's also just increased uh, paperwork and bureaucracy in terms of how we can export as well as obviously the increased taxes are you able i mean are you able to quantify the brexit effect on your business we haven't been able to quantify it but for us uh, so essentially our main markets were the uk and the us and then we had plans to go into europe but with everything that's been happening with brexit it just makes us relook at those plans and make different decisions okay final question the UK Chancellor has said he wants to turn the UK into the next Silicon Valley. In your view, sitting here as an entrepreneur in London, is that realistic as an aspiration? Absolutely. You know, we did our fundraise last year. It was the largest fundraise for Femtech. Uh, it beat anything in the US as well. And that just shows the level of commitment, investment and passion here in the UK. Well, that was Tanya Bowler, the chief executive officer of UK-based health tech company LV. Coming up, it's been a wild year, defined by lightning-fast inflation, a war in Europe and recession anxiety. We'll look back at some of the biggest moments of 2022. That's coming up next, and this is Bloomberg. So 2022 was quite the year. Here's Bloomberg's two minute roundup. In January, the Federal Reserve laid the groundwork to raise rates to tackle the fastest inflation in a generation, adding to global inflationary pressures, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. 
The attack began in late February and dominated headlines, from the destruction on the ground to U.S. sanctions on Russian banks and oligarchs. By March, attention zeroed in on the specific threats that Russia posed, restricting the flow of natural gas to Europe and attacks near a nuclear power plant in Ukraine. Corporate drama started to pick up in April when Elon Musk made a $43 billion offer to take Twitter private, while Netflix reported a loss in subscribers and changed its strategy to embrace advertising. The theme in May, market mayhem, as the Fed boosted the size of its rate hike to half a percentage point, sending U.S. stocks to 13-month lows, while a single trader at Citigroup made a mistake that sparked a flash crash in European stocks. Recession fears took root in June. Half the headlines of Bloomberg's 10 most read stories that month featured the R word. Another R word, Roe, after the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. Geopolitics were the big stories over the summer. The killing of former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe and Nancy Pelosi defying China when she visited Taiwan. The UK lost its longest serving monarch in September. Two weeks later, the new Prime Minister unveiled unfunded tax cuts that caused the pound to crash. In October, Credit Suisse became a meme stock, setting new lows as some retail investors bet the bank would go bust, while Xi Jinping consolidated his power, adding more loyalists to China's leadership. Crypto winter arrived in November when FTX collapsed, destabilizing the industry. And by December, bankers were tallying up the costs from slumping markets, sparked by the Fed's rate hike campaign. Their wallets will take a hit as Wall Street firms prepare to slash year-end bonuses. Well, that was Quick Take Scarlet Foo, reliving some of the biggest Bloomberg headlines from the last 12 months. Now let's get straight to your Bloomberg Business Flash. Here's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. FTX co-founder Sam Bankman-Fried has been released on a $250 million bail package after his first U.S. court appearance on fraud charges. A prosecutor calls it one of the largest pretrial bonds in U.S. history. The package includes a personal bond secured by his parents' house in California, where he is required to stay. His next court appearance is scheduled for January the 3rd. Now, BHP is to stand trial in the U.K over a 2015 dam collapse in Brazil that killed 19 people. A judge set a trial date for April 2024 to hear the claim on behalf of around 400,000 litigants seeking an estimated £10 billion. According to the firm representing the claimants, it will be the largest group action in English civil court history. Elon Musk says he's not planning to sell any Tesla shares for at least 18 months. Speaking on Twitter spaces. Musk also said he favours a share buyback once the company is more confident in the direction of the economy. The Tesla CEO has offloaded almost $40 billion worth of stock this year. Now that was mostly to fund his purchase of Twitter. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Francie. Leanne, thank you so much. Uh, Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour. Matt Miller in New York. Ed Ludlow is here in London. And this is Bloomberg. Our baseline is that the U.S. economy will avoid recession. We're going to go into a very uh, sort of below potential growth rate uh, uh, scenario. The recession is delayed primarily because of the lags and the effects of monetary tightening on, on the economy. The worse the economy is now, the, the better the market can be because the Fed will be able to lower rates even before re renewed expectations. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller, and Kaylee Lines. It is 5 a.m. in New York, 10 a.m. in London, 6 p.m. in Hong Kong. These are our top stories on Christmas Eve Eve. Among the biggest losers this month is Tesla. Elon Musk says he doesn't plan to sell shares of the EV maker for two years, although he's gone back on similar pledges at least twice this year. Tech bulls, by the way, faced their worst December since the dot-com bubble burst two decades ago. And today's PCE deflator could make things worse. Plus, Bankman Freed out on bail. The FTX co-founder was released on a $250 million bond, one of the biggest in U.S. history. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. I'm Matt Miller in New York. Ed Ludlow is with us out of London today. Anna Edwards and Kaylee Lines are 
off on some well-deserved vacation time. Ed, what do you see in terms of the market setup for this, the last trading day before Christmas? Yeah, I think we couch what's going on with thin volumes around Christmas Eve, Eve, as you put it. You know, there was some anxiety in the U.S. session Thursday that spilled over into Asia. It's a story about good economic data out of the U.S. enforcing the idea that the Fed will stay the course in its fight against inflation and continue with its outlook of raising rates. You look at the MSCI Asia Pacific down 1%. It's dropped in seven of the eight last eight sessions. Particular pain as well in the Chinese tech sector where we're seeing some of that kind of selling reflected of those higher multiple stocks that are rate sensitive in the US. That carried through throughout the Asian session. Inflation in Japan came in hottest since the 1980s. and It kind of reinforced this idea that the BOJ is set for this hawkish pivot earlier in the week has been the top story for markets. The BOJ reset the upper band for yields uh, to 50 basis points. And there's this idea that actually they'll now go a little bit further in light of that inflation print. In Europe, OK, look, we're treading water, Matt. I know that you would rather be in Jamaica than here with me on the show right now. But Europe <laughs> kind of feels similar. There's some green on the screen in continental and Western European markets, muted gains, thin volumes. You look at, for example, the stocks Europe 600. Yet there's some weakness in tech as well and some underperformance when it comes to areas like consumer discretion. We've made a few attempts this week to kind of rebound, particularly those rate sensitive stocks. I put the FTSE 100 up there. We're kind of modestly higher as we have been all week, three tenths of one percent. We're focused on strike action here in the UK, although there's no real read through to what that means for corporate Britain. And then yields, there's some movement in yields, right? I think that we're still kind of make sense of economic data. The focus of PCE will be huge throughout the day. It's interesting mm. because it is an important day to pr print, even though, again, Christmas Eve, Eve. Happy Christmas. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Merry Christmas to you as well. Yeah, I mean, PCE, the core PCE deflator is what the Fed supposedly cares about the most. And we're expecting a reading of 4.6% today. Let's take a look what's going on in U.S. markets right now. Futures, a very little changed on the S&P after a, a sizable drop yesterday. I think we were down about 1.5% yesterday on concerns about um, the Fed and how quickly it would raise interest rates. You see investors selling, though, um, the 10-year bond right now. So the yield rising two basis points to 369.86, getting back up there uh, a little bit. And NYMEX crude also continues to climb. Right now, 79.15. So really about the same level as we were 24 hours ago. When we looked at this, Ed, yesterday, we were just under $80 a barrel for WTI. But there are more questions about the reopening in China. Does does that drive crude prices higher or are the COVID infections so bad that the demand just really isn't going to be there? Um, that's a debate, I think, in the market right now. And then Bitcoin, um, you know, I'm, maybe I'll stop showing this in the new year if it continues to hold at this level. Um, there doesn't seem to be any movement in Bitcoin outside of uh, the FTX story. Not a lot of drama in the OG crypto world. And of course, we're going to talk about the FTX story, but Bitcoin really uh, is a separate issue. You. Global stocks stocks saw their biggest weekly outflow on record this week. That's according to Barclays strategist Emmanuel Cow. Bloomberg's Valerie Titel has the numbers and the reasons for us. Valerie? Thanks, Matt. Yes, you're right. $42 billion was pulled from equity markets on the week ending December 21st. So that encapsulates this week after we had the hawkish ECB meeting, the Fed meeting as well. $42 billion was pulled. Now, 90% of that came from U.S. equities. I've got a chart here which is showing the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ index. They've had a dismal performance in December, especially the NASDAQ. We're now only 2.5% away from the year-to-date lows, Matt. How depressing for December. Santa <laughs> clearly isn't deliver. Santa clearly didn't deliver. My theory is that he was distracted by the World Cup. But I got the one thing that can maybe have stocks end the, uh, end, end the, uh, end the weekend, end the year, on a more positive note, the core PCE inflation number that you were talking about, uh, the attention is really going to be on the core number month on month, Matt. It's going to, uh, the consensus at the moment is for 0.2. Anything lower than that, I think, would buoy stocks at the, uh, the end of this week and possibly into the few trading days we have next week. All right. Thanks to Bloomberg's Valerie Taito. You've got a flight to catch, haven't you? You better get going. Elon Musk says he is done selling Tesla stock, at least for now. The CEO has offloaded almost 40 billion dollars of stock this year, mostly to fund his purchase of Twitter. He made comments on a Twitter Spaces audio conference 
yesterday. I'm not selling any stock for, I don't know, a quarter minimum 18 to 24 months. So you can count on me like no, no stock sales till probably, I don't know, 25, 2025 or something. Joining us now, Bloomberg Global Autos editor Craig Trudell. It's exciting because he was my editor for quite a long time as well. We're modestly higher now in pre-market, eight tenths of one percent. We snapped five days of losses on Tesla. My point is, investors like what they heard. What did Elon Musk say? I, I think they like what what they heard. But to Matt's point earlier, uh, this is a case of maybe third times the charm, right? Where he said at least he said twice now uh, before yesterday that he was done selling, and then he went on to sell more. So he he uh, at first in April sold eight point five billion. In August, 6.9 billion. Both of those times is when he made his first statements that I'm done, and then he sold 4 billion more in November and 3.6 billion more this month. So I think that may help explain a little bit why you know we saw a, a positive reaction last night and maybe some of that coming down. The other reason that I, I would definitely be looking at what the stock does today is just you know the sort of downbeat uh, view that he offered on the economy. He said. Uh, you know, he does expect uh, an intense recession in 2023 and even likened it to being, you know, perhaps uh, similar to 2009. So obviously, you know, that's that's quite a serious uh, statement for him to be making. And and, you know, so it may be a case of a little bit of positive, but also some negative mix in I mean, last night. Does anything good happen anymore when Elon Musk talks? I feel like he's become <laughs> um, such a pariah that I wonder if it rubs off in a negative way on the auto brand. I mean, is it going to become uncool to drive a Tesla now? I think that even is, is a concern on the part of some of his biggest fans. And you heard it even come across on the Twitter spaces last night. There was one of his, his big fans referred to the idea that uh, he had a daughter who was trans and was, was really concerned about you know, his, uh, you know, jokey tweets about pronouns. We've also just, you know, seen this more than just anecdotal. We've seen this come across in consumer surveys and, and attempts to really get, uh, you know, arms around, you know, what this is doing to the Tesla brand. And, you know, before all of uh, the events of the last few months, you know, this was the case where, you know, Elon was, was cited as a reason that people, uh, you know, didn't have, have particularly fond feelings about the brand. So, he can both be their their you know biggest uh, you know proponent uh, a, a big you know to his credit uh, reason for why the stock was valued as highly as it was, but also he's been you know their biggest uh, you know enemy and, and a headwind as of late. All right, Craig, thanks very much for joining us, Craig Trudell. There, our global auto czar, talking to us about Elon Musk. Tesla and Twitter. Now, Sam Bankman Freed was released on bail after making his first U.S. court appearance here in New York. The terms include a $250 million bond secured by his parents' house in California, which must be an awesome house. Let's get more with Bloomberg's crypto reporter, Katie Greifeld. So, massive bond, and what kind of palatial estate? Do they live in? The mind runs wild, yeah. but there usually is a mismatch between, you know, huge bonds just such as this and what the actual equity being pledged is. I mean, $250 million, I'm sure there's houses like that in California, but uh, the house that we're talking about here, his parents' house, it's around 10% of that figure. Still. So, I know. They live in a $25 million house. I'd like to see it. So, I mean, we'll see what comes of this, what comes of the plea. But we know that the terms of this bail package is that he has to stay in the house with his parents. He also has to submit to electronic monitoring. So we'll see what happens here. But that is the news of the day of yesterday, in addition to the fact that we saw those former insiders, Caroline Ellison and Gary Wang, flipping, cooperating with prosecutors, what that means for the eventual plea that Bankman Freed enters uh, is probably the storyline to watch now. We shouldn't make light of what's happening, obviously. He's charged and indicted on some serious counts, but he does join this kind of group, select group of people. His bond matches Tom Barracks, who was acquitted last month of those charges that he was trying to influence U.S. policy on behalf of the UAE. And less than Robert Durst, who, who posted a $3 billion bond. He's the real estate heir, but he was also charged with murder, so it's slightly different. The serious side of this, KT, is we want to know what's going to happen to SBF for the days and weeks ahead, because we were kind of 
minutely following his travel from the Bahamas to New York. Mm -hmm. What is the process for him from now on? So just to put some that into context, that's important perspective to have $250 million. That's one of the largest pre-trial bonds in U.S. history. Is In terms of what happens now, again, we're waiting for a plea. The next court appearance scheduled for Sam Bankman-Fried is on January 3rd. We're not sure, again, what plea he will enter. But again, Ellison and Wang did plead guilty to fraud charges conspiracy to commit money laundering, and they are cooperating with prosecutors. Bankman Freed, throughout his media tour before he was actually arrested just 11 days ago, was that this wasn't intentional fraud. It was more just gross mismanagement of the company. But again, with those two cooperating, it's hard to get more inner circle than those two. That case is a little bit harder to make now. All right, Katie, thanks very much for joining us. Katie Greifeld here at the latest on FTX and F. SBF. I guess now we're just calling him Sam Bankman Freed to be more formal. Coming up, Roger Hallam, Vanguard head of global rates, joins us as we see uh, bond yields climb just a little bit. Have we hit? Did we see the peak in 2022? What are we expecting for 2023? And the impact of continued strikes on the UK economy. Sandra Horsfield, Investec economist, joins us to talk about uh, what it means for the economy already in a difficult position when nurses and rail workers and border force go on strike. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Ed Ludlow in London. My mate Matt Miller over in New York. China's soaring COVID infections are keeping people home and causing a slump in travel and economic activity. The COVID wave has heaped even more misery on the global economy, which according to Bloomberg Economics is set to experience one of its worst years in three decades. Joining us now, Jamie Rush, Chief European Economist for Bloomberg Economics. Jamie, you've got the enviable job of telling us what happens to the global economy in 2023. Take it away. No, it's hard enough watching that, that little that little clip on 2022. It feels absolutely exhausting, doesn't it? But I right. think the so what are we what are we looking at? China absolutely right that on the, the impact of, of the uh, the unlocking on Chinese activity and the spread of the virus, it's just a reminder that the spread of the virus clearly has a big impact as well as COVID restrictions do. But I think, uh, for China at least, we're expecting that growth's going to pick up pretty fast over 2023, up to 5% next year instead of more like 3 this year. And largely that's driven by COVID restrictions being lifted. But I think the if you look at the rest of the world, though, we are going to be slowing down fast. You know, the, the monetary policy tightening that we saw in 2022, we're going to be seeing the impact of that in 2023. And that explains why we're, we're expecting the global economy to, to post really, really weak growth, weaker since 1993, if you exclude some of the crisis years. Jamie, what does that mean for rates after, uh, you know, the worst year for rates, I guess, on record, we're going to be looking at what can we expect next year? Well, I think, so we're looking at inflation being pretty sticky globally. Um, and that's one of the things that we learned through the course of the year was that it's not just the US experiencing a demand-led inflationary shock. We also have some underlying stickiness in the UK and in the Eurozone. And so that's why we've seen the Bank of England and the ECB pivot and dash to catch up with the Fed. Um, our view is that we're going to be looking at something like 5% for the Fed, 4%-ish for the UK, uh, and about 3% for the ECB. But if I have to pick one where the uncertainty is greatest, I think it is the European Central Bank, because we just do not have the clarity on what's going on in the labour market, how, how much wage pressure is being generated there. Uh, and so there's, there's risk that there could be a pivot in either direction. Are there any tailwinds for 2023, Jamie? Any, I mean, we've, we've got these dour and depressing uh, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year commercials, and, and then your forecast I heard on the radio this morning, and I thought, God, is anything going to go right next year? Um, well, so we're seeing, we're seeing a much faster rollback of restrictions in China than was expected. So if anything, perhaps the risk to, the, to that side of our forecast is the upside. Um, 
other possibility is that somehow we just, you know, how wrong were we about inflation in 2022? Well, we could be wrong about it in 23, but the other direction. And if we get that, if we see commodity prices falling back, if we see that the defrosting of supply chains allows for, for price pressure to drop much faster than people anticipate, then maybe we end up in a world where the Fed has to cut next year and the e very different outlook for the global economy. Jamie, I think, you know, we, it's the Friday before Christmas and I'm not even sure who's on the other end of the camera, you know, listening to this broadcast from a markets participant perspective. But top of mind, I suppose, Friday is PCE. In Europe, I, I saw some commentary from Louis de Guindos this week on sort of mm. the messaging around 50 basis points. My question is, how much room is there for surprise from global central banks, really? Because I feel like I say the same, I report the same messaging from central banks each week, each quarter. We've not really gone off course, despite concerns from the market. Yeah, I think the Fed's been pretty clear. And even if they get a downside surprise to their PCE forecast, which is looking pretty likely, um, that they, they know what, what path they're on. Um, for the ECB, we're actually expecting a pretty big undershoot, both of the ECB's forecast and of consensus uh, when the inflation pub uh, figures are published for December. Um, and so that could actually tilt the balance in favour of, uh, of, of, of at least signalling that there's going to be a, a decrease in the pace of timing right. over the coming months. So I think the ECB is a chance that things will actually change quite a bit in the first quarter. Jamie, quickly, what are you hoping for this Christmas? Ha. Oh, just a bit of peace and quiet would be nice, thanks, Ed. <laughs> uh, I think that that's top of mind for all of us. <laughs> quite. Well, Jamie, Merry Christmas. Thank you for joining us this Friday. That's Jamie Rush of Bloomberg Economics. And for more market analysis, you can always check out M Live Go on your Bloomberg terminal. Ed, what do you want? This is, well, I tell you what I want, a bit of sunshine. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>
Among the biggest losers, the other biggest losers this month is Tesla. Elon Musk says he doesn't plan to sell shares of the EV maker for two years, although he's gone back on that uh, pledge at least twice already this year. And Sam Bankman-Fried is out on bail. The FTX co-founder was released on a $250 million bond, one of the biggest in U.S. history, although it's backed by a modest house in Palo Alto. I'm Matt Miller in New York with Ed Ludlow in London. Anna Edwards and Kaylee Lines are off today. And, Ed, as you would expect, we're experiencing extremely light volume uh, today. It's the day before the day before Christmas, so... Uh, anyone in his or her right mind is off work today. S&P futures are currently up about a quarter of 1% after a 1.5% drop in the cash trade yesterday. Though we do see investors selling bonds. You can see the 10-year yield floating up a little bit, just under two basis points to 369.67. We will be asking the question today, was that the peak for yields that we saw at like four and a quarter percent a couple of months ago, or what are we going to see in 2023 when it comes to rates? NYMEX crude is up 2% um, on the session, although at 79.17 a barrel for WTI, it's exactly where it was 24 hours ago. The question here is, does a reopening in China increase demand as more drivers get out there on the streets, or um, does the spike in COVID infections there cause people to stay home and actually, um, uh, actually act uh, in a negative way for the commodity. Bitcoin, meanwhile, doing a whole lot of nothing, $16,865, pretty much as usual. Ed, what do you see in terms of the European trade? Yeah, it's kind of interesting in the anxiety, I suppose, selling pressure that we saw in the US into Asia has not translated over into Europe. The stocks Europe 600 up half a percentage point. I would point out volumes are about 40% below their average. This is Christmas Eve Eve, as you put it, Matt. FTSE 100 up four tenths of 1%. I only put that on the board because I think a big focus for us is the UK economy, particularly in the context of strikes. Not that that translates through to corporate UK, but it is interesting to see the FTSE kind of trickle higher over the course of a week. Yields they're kind of inching higher, right? I think that there's a lot of emphasis on U.S. economic data, PCE, here in Europe as well, for those that are working. I have no idea how many people are actually at their desk in the city of London and Frankfurt and Paris right now. But there's also, I think, a little bit of stress still about global central banks, the direction of travel, the messaging. We were kind of talking earlier with uh, Jamie Rush, our European economist, about this, right, that there has been consistent messaging to an extent from policymakers. This week, it was Louis de Guindos of the ECB piping up about an ongoing 50 basis point increment going forward. But my question was, how much room is there for surprise? But all I'm pointing out is, amid thin volumes, amid everyone's mind kind of wandering into the weekend on Christmas Eve Eve, those yields just inching a little higher. All right, Roger Hallam, speaking of that, we're going to talk to him about yields. I'm going to put that question to him as well. Have we seen the peak in rates? What do you expect in 2023? Roger Hallam spent 20 years at J.P. Morgan Asset Management. He is now Vanguard's head of global rates, and he joins us to talk about this. Roger, great to get you um, uh, uh, on Christmas Eve Eve. Happy holidays, uh, first of all. Thanks so much for, for joining us early. Did we see the peak at four and a quarter in the 10 year yield? Are we headed down in 2023? I mean, I think 2022 has clearly been a very challenging year for government bond investors. But I think the message from central banks, as you highlighted over December, has been that there is still going you know, like to be further upwards pressure on yields, particularly in the short term, as central banks still remain very committed to fighting inflation. Only this month we've had the Fed upgrading its projections of where it intends to take its terminal rate. We've had the ECB announcing quantitative tightening. And obviously the Bank of Japan has surprised early ending its uh, yield curve, well, amending its, its yield curve control measures much earlier than the market expected this week. So I think there is still very much near-term pressure or uh, upwards pressure on bond yields. Why does the market find the Fed's forecast hard to believe? I mean, if I look at the uh, world interest rate probability screen in my Bloomberg, the WERP um, screen, I see the market is priced in a terminal rate of 4.5% at the top end of the range. That's below um, what the Fed has put out in, in its dot plot, below what um, Jerome Powell has told us at press conferences, why do they seem to lack credibility when it comes to market pricing? Well, I think 
there's two things. It, obviously, the, the last Fed meeting came on the back of a, a second consecutive downside surprise in inflation. And when you look at where in, inflation swap forwards discount inflation to fall to mid next year, it's towards two and a half percent. We've also got some concerning anecdotals that are around the labour market, and a consens the consensus is that we're going to see a recession in 2023. And the market doubts the Fed's resolve to remain hawkish uh, against a, a softening inflation environment and, and obviously a, a weak growth environment. But I think the Fed has tried to communicate, and, and, and I, I believe is, is, is um, credible in saying that it wants to take rates high and maintain rates high to squeeze inflation out of the system. It wants to avoid the mistakes of, of prior Federal Reserve governors of, of easing too quickly and, and, and seeing that inflation re-accelerate. Roger, after the Bank of Japan earlier this week, which we'll talk about in a second, but we, we got back onto the, the subjects of trust and messaging from central banks. I think it was Jim Carron and Morgan Stanley who earlier this week said, you know, that the market is getting this wrong. They're mispricing. But part of the emphasis he put on is the market being too focused on when rates come back down. They're looking too far ahead. My, my question is, what's the relationship right now between the Fed in particular and markets? Why is it that there is this gap in pricing and in messaging? I, I, I think it's, it's that we've never had a recession that's so well forecast by the, by the economics com community. And the market has seen the Fed tighten in with almost crisis-like speed this year. Yeah. And the market effectively believes, I think, that the, we haven't seen the full scale of the Fed's tightening feed through on, on growth. I, I think, yeah, there is that credibility gap, um, but I think the Fed is being quite consistent in its messaging. And I think for us, the, certainly in the near term, bond yields are going to have to reprice higher as the Fed delivers on uh, its forward guidance. The BOJ was a surprise, you know, resetting the, the, the upper limit of the band to 50 basis points. The inflation print in Japan overnight I think everyone's kind of expecting a pivot now. What's your read on the, the situation in Japan? I mean, I think the timing was a surprise, but the direction of travel, it wasn't. I mean, I think uh, yield curve control is a policy that's passed its sell-by date, both from a market functioning standpoint and also from an economic standpoint. From my perspective, there are clear parallels to what's happening in Japan around inflation compared to what happened in other Western economies a year or so ago. You've got a surge in goods price inflation towards 4%. Food inflation's up towards seven. Now, services price inflation is still relatively muted in Japan, but as Japan sort of completes its re COVID reopening process, I expect to see exactly the same service price inflation surge impacting inflation expectations, impacting that wage formation process. And I think that's why ultimately the Bank of Japan felt it had to start to move early. We think that when the new governor comes in in, in, in the second quarter of next year, the bank, the bank chairman would determine its yield curve control policy, and that will keep uh, JGB yields under upwards pressure. What, what do you expect in terms of uh, currencies, Roger? You spent a long time in charge of currencies in your, uh, for your previous employer. Um, when, when you look at the pound right now, the euro, the yen, does anything stick out to you as exciting in 2023? I mean, the dollar's been incredibly strong this year, driven, I think, by two, two key factors. One, that policy divergence between the Federal Reserve and, our, and the central banks and the rest of the world, but also by a clear terms of trade impact. Now, the high energy prices have taken lumps out of the European current account surplus and Japan's current account surplus. Now, obviously, those, currents, those economies now run uh, current account deficits. As we look forward, I think we're going to see more policy convergence between uh, the Federal Reserve and what's happening in the Bank of Japan and the ECB. And that should lead to some degree of dollar weakness. Need to be careful there, though, because that terms of trade impact, which has uh, sort of clearly hurt euro and yen performance this year, isn't really going away. We don't see a significant rebound in the balance of payment surpluses for euros or, or yen. So I think you should see some modest dollar weakness, but we won't be going back to the levels of, 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 of the past few years. Roger, thanks so much for joining us. Great to get your take. Roger Hallam of Vanguard, one of the few uh, strategists who actually is also a virologist. I'm sure that's been very helpful um, over the last couple of years in this industry. Coming up, we're going to discuss the economic outlook, especially for Great Britain with Sandra Horsfield, Investec economist, as the uh, United Kingdom reels from strikes across industries. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Ed Ludlow in London with Matt Miller, who's over in New York. Now, today is the first day of UK border strikes at airports in London over an ongoing disagreement on pay. Joining us right now, Bloomberg's Eamon Farhat, who, by the way, was at Heathrow earlier this morning, where workers have started their eight-day walkout, which stretches through to New Year's Eve. What's happening on the ground there in Heathrow? Yeah, so um, Border Forces, they had a walkout today. Um, it's going to be eight days over the, the Christmas and New Year period. Um, the army is actually taking the place of border officers at Heathrow this morning, checking people's passports. Um, not much disruption this morning at Heathrow, but there are already escalations being threatened by the Union into next year, so we could see more action into January of 2023. So, Eamon, what exactly um, do the striking workers want? We know that there's been incredible inflation in the UK, more so than in the rest of Europe and in the US. Um, are they just asking for pay rises to meet those demands? Yeah, they're definitely asking for a pay rise. You know, the cost of living is hitting everyone very hard. You know, the, the people I was talking to today, these, these border workers, they're really feeling the effect. You know, they see people going every day on holiday, these happy families, and they're saying they can't afford to bring their family maybe once every five years, if that. They also can't afford their mortgages, their bills. They have to sell their houses, go live further away. So it's really hitting their pocket, and they just want to get a pay rise, and they want to go straight to the government to get that. All right, Bloomberg's Eamon Farha. Eamon, thank you very much for your on-the-ground reporting and also for getting back to the office so quickly <laughs> for your report. Joining us now is Sandra Horsfield, an Investec economist. We've got to talk about the read-through, I suppose, between the strike action, which we've just put on the screen, you know, the, the breadth of it, but also where we are at the end of the year with the UK economy. I've actually never really appreciated or understood this, that, you know, there's data that came out last week about the depression in restaurant sales, for example, in that one-week period. Uh, due to a lack of being able to travel in and out of London, for example. But when you, you, you sort of take a step back, does strike action have a long-term impact on the economy, on growth? The impact of strike action is twofold. One, the, the direct effects, of course, uh, ambulance workers that aren't driving an ambulance aren't producing the output they would do, uh, Royal Mail similarly. Um, at the same time, there are the indirect effects that you alluded to, for instance, um, the displacement. Commuters can't commute, they can't uh, do their city centre shopping, they can't uh, use hospitality in the city centre. That's much harder to quantify than the direct effects, though, because it may be that some of that uh, is simply displaced. Right. So rather than going into city centres, um, out of centre, uh, shopping centres are used, hospitality near a home is used, etc. So the net impact may not be the large. Also, we have to bear in mind uh, those who can work from home uh, have found much more infrastructure put in place, obviously, during the pandemic yeah. to do so. So rail strikes, for instance, may not have quite the same impact as they would have done some years ago when it wasn't such an... That's an interesting problem. point, though, that, I mean, structurally, the economy has changed because of COVID in the last two years. That said, you know, as, 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 as Matt and, and I have outlined, there is a reason that these strikes are happening that because of, of pain essentially, in the economy, inflation, cost of living, and then wage inflation kind of comes into that as well. Uh, it, what is your read? Give us your sort of top-line conclusion of where the UK economy ends 2022. As we currently uh, head towards the end of the year, we are clearly in the grip of generally cost of living pressures. Those have manifested throughout this year and we've had unexpected cost of living increases, which is why wage pre uh, settlements so far haven't reflected the sort of uh, wage, uh, the price increases that we're seeing. So they're real losses uh, had here. These real losses we expect to continue uh, and to carry through into 2023. If 2022 was a year of inflation, 2023 may be the year of recession. So the question is how much there do we get um, in terms of a loosening in the labour market and therefore some reduction of these wage pressures or just simply how much more pressure is there for catch up um, in terms of price pressures. Sandra, it seems to me if this were a one off, um, it would be easy to deal with pay rise and done. Right. But um, at least from my perspective here in New York, it seems that workers in London go on strike almost constantly. I mean, you've spent a couple of decades in uh, in the city. You did your degrees at, at the LSE. You know, rail workers are always going on strike. Um, are they kind of the boy who cried wolf in a sense? 
I think that there are certain industries uh, that are more prone to strike action than others. Um, as we said, the situation is becoming more difficult because of those structural changes that we're talking about. So how does the rail industry deal with income uh, effects that may come about due to shifting working patterns? How permanent are they? Perhaps this will change if more workers are coming back in to the office. So there's some structural questions that need to be asked that go beyond the, the simple uh, wage negotiations, don't, don't reach a certain point. Why, why, um, why push back against the nurses? I mean, the healthcare sector is one that I really don't understand, especially after, you know, everyone um, was in the streets applauding them throughout the pandemic, um, you know, even conservative members of the government. And yet, you don't want to give, as if nurses are overpaid, you don't want to give them a raise or ambulance drivers a raise. Is it just, is the money just not there in the budget, Sandra? I think that is uh, the main part of the problem. Uh, giving pay rises to nurses uh, is a different matter to giving pay rises um, to private sector workers because, of course, the cost uh, of providing the NHS services isn't charged. So you don't get the risk of wage price spirals in the same way um, for the public sector, such as nurses. But the cost comes out the other side on the fiscal side. And there we have learned that the fiscal uh, situation in the UK is very strained. Um, and uh, awarding large uh, pay rises that are costly uh, could spook markets yet again, saying, well, how are you going to fund this? Uh, is it going to be yet more borrowing? We obviously know that markets have been very sensitive to that in the UK, given what happened in the aftermath of the Trust Quateng mini budget. Um, and so that's an extra consideration specific to the UK to take into account. Got it. All right. Mini budget is a phrase I think has been etched into our minds forever. Sandra, great to have you. Thanks so much for joining us. Sandra Horsfield there of Investec talking to us about uh, the UK economy in an incredibly difficult time. I think uh, even relative to the difficulty we're seeing in other Western economies. In terms of what's going on in China, um, those difficulties may eclipse everything. We're looking at headlines coming across the Bloomberg terminal right now that um, say China estimates COVID surge infecting 37 million people a day. 37 million new infections a day, uh, according to estimates out of China in terms of COVID as they reverse their uh, COVID zero policy. We'll continue to follow that. We will also bring you um, uh, what we know and, and, and what we miss about Guggenheim Partners CIO Scott Minard died yesterday or, or Wednesday, I should say, at 63 years old. We'll reflect on the life and legacy of uh, someone special in the financial industry. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller in New York with Ed Ludlow in London. Now, Scott Minard, who was regarded as one of the kings of the bond market during its four decade bull run, has died. He was only 63 years old. Bloomberg Shanali Basic has spoken with Minard and reported on him over the years, and she joins us now here in studio. Really sad announcement, I think, for anyone who worked closely uh, with Scott. He was admired um, for his acumen, but also you know, people just liked him. Yeah, I've covered him for 10 years, and I think what's remarkable about him is that through good times and bad, good years, bad years, tough times within Guggenheim, he was always not only professional, but always had a, a really respectful demeanor about him. I also miss, you know, he would just call me randomly sometimes if he changed his mind about the way he saw the markets. He was so passionate about the job. I would just hear from him on a whim when he was ready to make any given pivot. I think 2020 was one of those most not more notable years, right? Because you had him warning about COVID back in February before the world shut down. And people were thinking he was crazy, he was paranoid, but then the world did indeed shut down. He had 10% of his portfolio tied to just airlines. And so he had to pivot very quickly. He was selling, selling, selling. And then I remember the morning of March 23rd when the Fed stepped in, he started putting seven billion dollars to work and that yeah. one bet on high yields helped them beat 97 percent of their peers that year so conviction is really what he is marked by sometimes right. he was right sometimes it, he was wrong it, it's not, 
it, it, it's amazing his his name as it stands in the market, right? I just want to say, Shanali, you know, I never met Scott. Uh, I, I was a viewer regularly of our Fed specials, right, At which, of which he attended uh, and gave his immediate reaction to the Fed so often. You wrote a beautiful uh, summary, actually, of his life, if you don't mind me saying, and I encourage the audience to read it on the Bloomberg Terminal. I'm, I, I, I'm a Californian, right, believe it or not, with my voice. He loves okay. California. He was unusual uh, in the sense that he wasn't interested in being in Manhattan. Just give us some of the details of his life and, and some of the things that you learned meeting, speaking to him. Yeah, it's interesting because certainly we wrote that he was a Wall Street outsider who made it his home. And remember, he grew up son of an insurance salesman in coal mining country in Pennsylvania. When he came to Wall Street, he ended up retiring early, living in California, getting married to his now uh, husband who he's survived by. And I've got to say, whenever I followed Scott around, he had the strangest group of people around him all the time, this very eclectic crowd, not the typical Wall Street crowd. I'm talking about one day I'm with him and, Sil and Sylvester Stallone is calling him for insurance advice. Or, for example, <laughs> he was very close to Kerry Kennedy and with the Ripple of Hope dinner every year was one of his favorite events. And, uh, and Arnold Schwarzenegger, of course, as well. They shared a love of bodybuilding. Once I was trying to interview him at Davos, I hop into his car and a Norwegian, uh, Norwegian government official was in there too. And all of a sudden we're talking about everything from bonds to uh, the Arctic because that was another one of his passions and he Climate. talked about it incessantly. Right. And so uh, definitely a very eclectic person on Wall Street and he will be very, very, very sorely missed. Absolutely. Shanali, thanks so much for your reporting. Scott Minard was only 63.